Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Georgetown University Alumni Association and the Georgetown Legacy Society. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for today's program, Critical Issues in Planning Your Estate with Susan Oldham. I'm Mindy Siebenhaller, the Executive Director of the Office of Plan Giving at Georgetown, and I'll be facilitating today's program. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we start. Today's session is being recorded and the recording will be shared with attendees via a follow-up email. The information in this webinar is not intended to be legal, financial, or tax advice. We encourage you to consult with an attorney or financial advisor for your own planning. And thank you to everyone also who pre-submitted questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. You can also submit your questions via the, uh, the question section of the webinar control panel. Um, and then now let me introduce our speaker, Susan Oldham. Susan is a tax attorney whose practice focuses exclusively on estate planning and estate administration. She earned her JD and LLM in taxation from Georgetown Law, where she served as an associate editor of the Georgetown Law Journal. Susan was a founding member and co-chair of Women in Law of Georgetown. She has also served on the National Law Alumni Board and is the recipient of the Outstanding Alumna Award. Admitted to the bar in Maryland and the District of Columbia, Susan is an active member of the estate and trust sections and the taxation sections of both jurisdictions. She has been featured in both Washingtonian Magazine and Bethesda Magazine as one of the area's foremost estate planning attorneys. Without further delay, I'm pleased to turn things over to Susan. Thank you very much, Mindy. And thank you to everyone for sharing your day with us today to talk about what we consider an important topic. Uh, during a pandemic, um, more than ever, we think about things that really matter in our lives and estate planning certainly comes up on the list of those things for most of us. My favorite definition of estate planning, because it means many different things to different people, um, is the simplest one, that estate planning is an effort to take care of everything you own, provide for everyone you love, and plus, and this is an important part of estate planning today, plus take care of yourself in the event of a possible incapacity or period of disability. With that, it's rather surprising that in the U.S., 70% of Americans report that they do not have an updated will or estate planning. Even more pertinent to what we will be discussing today is the fact that of those who do have an estate plan, 85% of those plans actually have significant pitfalls in them that will lead to problems. That leads us to our somewhat unusual title for our estate planning webinar today. As you can see, um, it's critical planning, but we're talking about avoiding costly mistakes or unintended errors, family feuds, and unnecessary stress. So this will not be a typical estate planning 101 survey course about estate planning, but we will find that as we work through all of the many topics, we will actually have touched upon most of the fundamentals of estate planning in doing so. We all learn from mistakes. One of the um, nice parts of this enterprise is that today we're going to learn from the mistakes of others as we learn about pitfalls to avoid and help ourselves maintain that through careful planning. So let's get started. As we begin to consider what some of the pitfalls are, what some of the problems are, and always also thinking about how planning can avoid each one of those, it became apparent that the top pitfalls tend to fall in four general categories of the types of problems that occur. There are planning failures that can leave the inheritance to the wrong people. Now, that does not mean a case of mistaken identity or a typo in the will. It simply means that by our failure to understand the fundamentals of how property is controlled at death and to keep that in focus as life moves on, 
we can, in fact, end up leaving our inheritance not to the people we actually have in mind when all is said and done, but to the wrong people. Another important category, because we're all trying to make things simple, um, is that we can essentially find that we have choosing, we're choosing shortcuts, mostly those that are designed to avoid probate, but choosing those shortcuts can actually create unnecessary avoidable risks, both to our beneficiaries, but even very clearly to ourselves. Things that seem seductively simple uh, can actually sabotage what would otherwise be very good planning. A third general category is what I've titled ignoring the bonus protections that can needlessly expose our assets to creditors and predators as they are inherited by our loved ones. This bonus gift of protecting the inheritance has become a major focus of estate planning today. We actually can do far more to protect assets for those who receive our inheritance than we could do to protect our assets during our own lifetime. So we'll take a look at how we can use some of those bonus protection tools as we are planning our own estate planning documents. The fourth general category is one in which we fail to add detailed guidance, and by failing to do that, we can actually create classic family feuds. Another goal of estate planning always is to minimize conflict in families, minimize worries, minimize hassles. So we want to do all we can to avoid those hassles and problems, never create them. So we'll take a look at what those pitfalls are and what we can do to avoid them. So getting to the first one in category one, leaving our inheritance to the wrong people, taking a look at that pitfall. That leads us to examining the critical foundation of understanding how property is actually controlled at death. This will be very familiar to most of you, but it can be easy to lose sight of how property will be controlled at death as we have structured things in our lifetime, time moves on and our affairs become a bit more complicated. When people think of estate planning, they automatically tend to think of the will. The will is a very important document, of course. It's often the linchpin of the whole plan. In reality, however, today, when all is said and done, we will find with many of us that most of our property at death will not actually be controlled by the will. It will be controlled by many other arrangements that we have intentionally made over our lifetime to control various assets. So let's take a look at what those are. Many assets will be controlled by a trust. There are all different kinds of trusts. One categorization is a trust can be revocable, meaning you can change it and revoke it at any time, just like you can change or revoke your will. Other trusts are irrevocable meaning that once the trust is set up, it receives assets, and those that trust cannot be altered or changed. It is intended to control those assets, and it's often done to minimize taxes or for other reasons to protect those assets. So we're taking a look at how property is controlled. The key thing to know is that if an asset is to be controlled by the trust, it has to be, as we say, funded into the trust, meaning the title has to be changed to reflect that, and also that once that is done, what we say in our will about that asset will actually have no effect because it will be controlled by the trust agreement that we've set up. Beneficiary designations, another very fundamental part of controlling property, is one familiar to most of us, certainly, and it's one that we use more and more as life moves on. Typical assets, which can be very major assets, particularly as life moves on, are retirement plan assets. 
where one sets up a beneficiary upon setting up the plan. And then often we don't revisit that as often as we should. Uh, and it's important always to know what that is and to be sure that that is coordinated with all of our other plans. Also life insurance, very important to know what we have completed as the beneficiary for life insurance and to be sure that still reflects our wishes. It is not unusual as people are updating their estate plan and they're finally persuaded that we actually do need to go back and revisit all of their agreements about assets to find out that there's a life insurance policy that they perhaps acquired while they were in professional school and named their parents as the beneficiaries. Their parents are now very wealthy and elderly and the client has children and a family and just has not realized that that life insurance policy is actually not going to pass to the intended beneficiaries unless more action is taken. Also, we have assets that can be controlled in a way where people think this is a, and it, it's a well-intentioned technique to avoid probate, but the idea is for paying on death or transfer on death to our intended beneficiaries, POD, TOD. They can be very helpful shortcuts in the right situation, but it's important to be sure that when all is said and done, that we remain cognizant of what we have set up and how all of the assets fit together to be sure that it still meets our plans, our needs, our goals. And another final way of minimizing probate is by jointly titling our property. And there are three essentially basic types of joint titling and they have very different uses and very different consequences. So let's just take a brief look at them and then we're done with the fundamentals of how property is controlled. Uh, one is tenants in common. That means that two or more people can own an asset, a piece of property perhaps two friends buy a beach house and essentially half of it in each person's t name, that half interest will be controlled by that person's own estate plan. Very different from that is titling real property joint tenants with right of survivorship, often just abbreviated JTWROS like you see here. That's used frequently and what that means is if the death of one person on the account or the deed that property will pass automatically outside of any will or trust by operation of law to the other person or persons on that deed or that account. That's often exactly what everyone has in mind, but sometimes it's not and people don't quite realize what setting up a plan that way will actually entail down the road. Tenants by the entireties is an elevated form of joint tenancy with right of survivorship that can only be set up between husband and wife, that's used very widely and it has the extra benefit of asset protection. That's a very helpful, valuable asset protection shortcut tool to use, uh, primarily for real property, but it can be used for other assets as well. So that is a, a bonus protection to consider carefully and in most cases a very valuable thing to do. The key point is that all titling and beneficiary designations, be they on accounts, deeds, insurance, retirement plans, whatever we're controlling, it must be coordinated with the provisions in our wills and trusts. So we, can't, we don't want to find that we have a beneficiary designation on something and then we update the will and say that we give that asset to person number three because that will not occur that beneficiary designation is a contract and that's what's going to happen with it. So it's important that we don't lose sight of that and also keep those plans up to date. As time goes on, those things become very, very important, uh, particularly if we have old asset arrangements that were done with parents named or with someone named long ago where it's not at all appropriate. Also a very important thing to do the follow-up work after divorce. It, it will be a property settlement agreement that will resolve issues about major assets in that property settlement agreement. 
but it's very important that then the individual go back and actually change those assets to reflect what was agreed upon. I recently ran across a situation where someone had been divorced for 40 years, had been awarded a house, but the deed still had the house with both names on the deed. Fortunately, she was able to take care of that, but she was totally unaware of it, hadn't really thought about it at the time, um, and that can be uh, a major court battle and create a real problem. Of course, after divorce, one can always c continue to provide for a spouse and can do so intentionally, but it's these unintentional arrangements we want to be sure we don't have as a pitfall of our own planning. One of the most worrisome uh, ways in which we can leave our inheritance to the wrong people is one we are seeing more and more frequently today. Many of us have been through this arrangement, this situation, I should say, vicariously. We're all living longer. Um, 100 years ago, the average lifespan was 45 years. That's startling, but that's what it was. Today, those over 65 have a life expectancy well into the 80s and beyond. It's wonderful that we're living longer. As part of that, we have a longer period of time in which we can manage to make our lives more complicated, more complex, and have more relationships and have more arrangements that need to be sorted through and taken care of correctly. So we need to be certain that we have thought through and provided for what we care most about very often in our estate planning. Because we're living longer, it is far more frequently the case that one person in a marriage will pass away Time will go on, and even though, and I've had, I've been with some of my clients for well over 30 years or longer, um, so I've seen through the cycles of life, and when the first spouse passes away, there's absolutely no thought of any remarriage ever happening, but then life goes on, and at some point, the surviving parent calls and says, I didn't think this would ever happen, but I'm thinking about getting married and I need to come in and figure out what I should do to make sure that everything is protected for my children. So it can be a situation in which the surviving parent remarries and then dies before the new spouse. That's one of the two ways we can find out that without planning we may find we have fallen into a pitfall in which Inadvertently, the children may be disinherited. In the same respect, the other major way in which this can happen is that the surviving pa parent remarries, and then, and as you may know, second marriages have a much higher divorce rate than first marriages, so it can happen even more frequently that that new marriage ends in a divorce. Without planning, that new spouse may end up claiming the assets, and with that, the children may be disinherited. So either way, we can have a pitfall where the new spouse, in this case, inherits all of the property and then ends up leaving it eventually to their own beneficiaries, be it their own children, their own favorite charities or other people whom they want to provide for. Or in the case of a divorce in a second marriage, third marriage, it can be the situation where during the divorce, the new spouse can successfully claim assets. It was never thought through how this could happen. And assets that were intended to go to the children will actually end up going to someone else. The law has tried to respond to these situations and there are various ways to go about it. The key thing is thinking about 
doing it, understanding the need for it, gaining the co cooperation of all the parties involved to make it happen without terrible conflict, and protecting the children while there is time to protect them. The first technique is a standard prenuptial agreement before any remarriage occurs where the surviving spouse and the fiance make specific plans and agreements of what their rights will be with the assets they both bring to the marriage and protecting the inheritance for the children involved on either side, both sides. A prenuptial agreement with good estate planning reflecting that can handle this situation very well and the children, if they are adult children, will be very relieved to know that attention has been paid to that and that that is taken care of. Hopefully it won't be a prenuptial agreement which just gets signed at the rehearsal dinner. We've all heard about those horror stories and it's no way to start a marriage. So giving thought to that in advance is a very important thing to avoid this very painful pitfall which can occur. If a prenuptial agreement, and I should mention this is sort of the intersection of estate planning and family law. You know, very often there's um, a meeting of the minds of two professionals working on this and typically each person should have his and her own counsel because it needs to be done with full knowledge and good representation. But it's a very good way to handle things and definitely to approach them early, understand the issues and handle them well in advance. If that doesn't happen and the people involved in the second marriage begin to realize that they should have done something, then there can be a postnuptial agreement combined with new estate planning to address the same issues. Um, that's it's just more of a focus in forming a relationship. And, and frankly, if, if both of the people entering into a remarriage if they both have assets on a somewhat commensurate level or simply both have assets and understand the issues and are people of good faith and if they both have children then they understand exactly what it is they're trying to accomplish and it can work very well. They both want the same arrangement, they want everyone protected, they want no misunderstandings and that kind of arrangement can happen very smoothly and often does. However, if only one person has substantial assets and if only one person has children to protect or to be concerned about, then it can lead to very difficult dynamics. Um, naturally, two people are blending their lives and it's very understandable for one, the new spouse to say, well, you're trusting your life with me. Don't you trust that I would do the right thing for your children? Can't we just trust each other for this? And the answer is that, well, yes, trusting one another is just wonderful, but with all arrangements where someone else is going to be so affected, putting that in writing and having it be understood and having it be available when needed is a critical protection for the family unit. The best way to proceed with this, in, in my view, and the law is coming along in providing for this arrangement, it's a fairly recent approach, but it can be very helpful, is that when we have the parents, the parents of the children in the first marriage, doing their own estate planning, that the issue comes up before them to understand that there can easily be a situation. Uh, it's common, common accidents with both spouses perishing at exactly the same time are actually rather rare. So it's very likely that one person will pass away first and there will be a surviving spouse. And as we're all living longer, it's more likely than it used to be that there could in fact be a remarriage. 
Therefore, well-intentioned people can do advanced planning, and I highly recommend it, uh, to plan in their own documents to include mutual mandatory provisions to protect the inheritance intended for their children. Each plan, meaning each will or each trust, will essentially say that um, if I am the surviving spouse, then, or if I'm the spouse that passes away, this understood that in the event that uh, there is a remarriage, that the person remarrying must obtain a prenuptial agreement prior to any marriage. That avoids the at the last minute or after the fact or avoids missing it happening at all. That it has to happen and that the provisions will must require that the fiancé entering into that marriage has to waive all rights and claims in the inheritance that is intended for the children. The money that was typically set up in a trust that is available to the surviving spouse during lifetime that was an asset of the spouse who has passed away that is for the surviving spouse and then anything not needed by the surviving spouse is to pass on to the children of that first marriage. So the fiancé must waive all rights and claims in the inheritance. The surviving spouse may not be thrilled. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the fiancé um, of the surviving spouse may not be thrilled upon learning this, but the very helpful advantage of having this planning in the document is first of all that it's been thought through and it's part of your basic estate planning but secondly the enforcement of that provision the carrot the enforcement or the punishment if it's not done is that the surviving spouse would lose himself or herself the access to the money in that trust that it's then locked up for the children completely so that the surviving spouse who was assuming that that person would have the benefit of it if needed will have lost the benefit of it. That's an easy thing to explain to the fiance. Well, darling, of course I trust you, but my spouse and I agreed that we would do this for the sake of our children. And if I don't get your agreement to waive all your rights, then I don't get access to that money and so I will have less. That's a very, very helpful incentive system to accomplish what virtually any parent wants to accomplish anyway. So I highly recommend giving that some thought. Another way in which we can leave the inheritance to the wrong people, and, that, and we're ready for the next slide, thank you is that we need to think through so many what-ifs in estate planning. At its heart, estate planning is largely contingency planning. What I found with clients is um, that there's a, there's a lot of thinking that goes into developing your estate plan, a lot of thoughtful questions to consider and answer. And as clients often tell me, just as I have answered your question, then you say, okay, but what if this happens? And, uh, but that's our job, um, that we need to be sure that we have thought through based on rational analysis, but also based on the experiences that we've seen, we need to think through what can happen and make sure that we each have helped our clients plan for those contingencies that maybe aren't at all probable to happen, but certainly can happen. So we need to do what we basically fall into the category of planning for contingent beneficiary arrangements in virtually everything that we set up. The pitfall is, uh, well, there are two general types of pitfalls. One is, the risk of a common family tragedy, meaning that in the usual, the usual nuclear planning mode 
um, where back to the definition of estate planning, we're trying to plan for everything we own and everyone we care about and want to take care of, that it can happen in unusual situations that all of those people that we have put into a well thought through plan can actually meet with a common tragedy. In today's world, we might, and I apologize in advance for pinning these tragedies to bring into focus the kinds of things that can come up and that we try to plan around and be uh, prepared for. Um, so a common thought today to trigger that thought would be a destination wedding where multiple generations get on a plane and head to a wonderful place for a wonderful event and there's a tragic accident. The estate plans have been done, but in large part, those estate plans provide for all of those people who were on the plane that just met with a disaster. In the past, the example I found myself thinking of um, was that in 1912, um, the world's wealthiest families were on a ship we've all come to know from books and movies, the Titanic, and the wealthiest families were on board and probably back home, um, their business managers had in filed away in a desk a wonderful estate plan where everyone on that that um, ship had made great plans, providing the best planning at the time for those beneficiaries. But then everyone perished. The equivalent today would also be a young family piling into the minivan and getting on the interstate, and a tragedy comes and maybe grandma's even in the back seat. So we need to realize that any of our beneficiaries can meet with tragedy. We tend to think that younger beneficiaries will survive us, but younger beneficiaries may predecease us. Any of our beneficiaries may predecease us. And in every event, we need to ask ourselves the question, what do I want to have happen if that person doesn't survive me? It can be a very different customized arrangement, of course, for each person, maybe leaving money to a friend and, and not have a relationship with that friend's children or spouse at all, in which case you don't want it to pass according to that person's own estate planning. So it's an opportunity to think through what we would want in each and every, each and every situation, particularly in the case of a possible family tragedy. So we want to include contingency planning for all distributions, and this often leads to, among the solutions, an opportunity to consider expanded charitable giving. If this means that our closest, our people closest to us will have perished and we don't need to be providing for them, um, it's a chance to redirect other things in our legacy planning and consider those kinds of things as well. Husband and wife doing planning also need to take a close look at their contingency beneficiaries. Um, as after a couple has taken care of their planning for their immediate family, so we have a trust for the surviving spouse, we have a trust for the children, for each child to break off when they're at a certain age and we have all that planning in place. And then we have a provision if there is a family catastrophe um, or if our child predeceases us. We need to take a look at that because it can easily be that when we come to what we call the remote contingent beneficiaries, the beneficiaries we want to include if our primary beneficiaries are not surviving us, then we want to coordinate that between a husband and wife. Uh, if we can think about, and again, forgive me the tragedies, but the husband and wife uh, driving on the interstate and an accident occurs and they're both um, terribly injured, one dies immediately. Well, that person's document may leave everything to the surviving spouse and then a week later at the hospital, the surviving spouse dies of the same accident 
so no opportunity to give any thought to planning. And what we find out as we look at things is that all of the assets of the first spouse to perish immediately will pass to the surviving spouse and be controlled by his or her document. Then when that person dies, leaving no one behind, then that person's remote contingent beneficiaries, who may be um, siblings or best friends or that person's favorite charities, which perhaps was never coordinated with the other spouse's siblings or favorite charities, uh, what that family unit had all goes to one side of the family or one set of charitable recipients or just not at all what they really had in mind. So it's a very good idea to take a look at a comprehensive plan element for that part of estate planning and see if, in fact, it doesn't work better with husband and wife both cooperating in this to, for them to come up with a blend of their remote contingent beneficiaries so that there is a balance uh, so that we don't worry that this unintended pitfall could occur. Now we're going to get into looking at the category of pitfalls, which we've titled Risky Shortcuts. And these are typically shortcuts taken to avoid probate. We should first maybe take a look at, most people, most of us have a general idea of what probate is, but it's important to just kind of revisit. And some people say, what exactly is probate anyway, if they've not been down the road for administering an estate or being involved in any way? Probate is a very well-intentioned government process. The goal is very well-intentioned. It's to be sure that when someone dies, that the correct will is filed, that the correct people are notified, that there are procedures that are followed, that we know that the right people are informed and have a chance to know that probate is happening, and to, to be sure that the person being appointed is the correct person, and of course, uh, to be sure that bills are paid first, taxes paid first, and those kinds of concerns. So the government is involved in overseeing all of this and trying to make sure that we do the right thing. So why is it so important that probate be avoided? Why is this such a, a passionate interest of, of many people? AARP used to do a cover story with their magazine almost every year on why you must avoid probate or words to that effect. Uh, with probate avoidance and use of trust being so commonplace, I'm not sure it's a cover story anymore, but they still have articles and it's still an important consideration. The reason people dislike probate, well, there are, there are several, um, but essentially it's a well-intentioned government process, so with that, of course, will come well-intentioned government forms. Uh, and those forms are, they take effort, um, they have deadlines, and they can be intimidating. So um, people would rather find a simpler way to avoid that and have things be more streamlined. Um, also, probate being a government uh, overseen process, it's not a private process. Uh, there's a public file that is open when someone dies, if their assets go through probate. And that file is available. Um, I don't think too many people spend their time doing this, but a nosy neighbor who always wondered what Mrs. Jones owned and who's going to get it can go into the Register of Worlds reading room and request the file and take a look at what there is and where it's going. So as we think about that, that's pretty offensive. Uh, so we want to be sure that we have taken care of that. So there are various ways that we can go about that, but we need to make sure that as we're choosing our plan to do that, that we're also protecting ourselves and understanding what the trade-offs are. So we've talked about joint titling, and a common way people often are going about and trying to avoid probate is by adding an adult child onto their assets. That is for convenience, so they can pay bills. Um, 
it's done so that they think things will work smoothly. And of course, down the road, many of us will need some help paying bills and taking care of things, so it makes some sense. However, what they don't realize is they put an adult child on their major accounts is that they have just made that child a joint owner of that asset. Now, I've actually never seen it happen in my practice where that child then absconds with the money and heads off to an island and is never heard of again. I don't think that's normally the major risk, but there is a very important risk. That child is a joint owner. That child may have a problem occur, an accident with damages beyond the child's insurance, or may have a creditor problem, could be sued for various reasons, for a business reason. That asset is actually the child's asset also. The creditors of the child will come after all of those assets and has a very good chance of prevailing because that child has become a joint owner of those assets. The account that was intended for convenience and paying bills will have just subjected that account to being to disappearing. Um, also, an, ac an account that has a child added to it just for convenience may then um, not result in that, but upon death, that child who was added to the account will, in most circumstances, inherit the account. The honorable thing can be that the child can still disclaim, make arrangements, say it was a convenience account, can unwind that. But very often that same child who was added onto the account because that's the child who's closest in the area will be helping the most in all of this over time, has done a lot of work, begins to feel a little entitled, and doesn't feel like unwinding it. So these things can lead to a lot of misunderstandings. The key point is there are better ways to accomplish that same goal. Simplest way here is a power of attorney arrangement whereby the individual can have access to help the owner with the assets, do what needs to be done, but doesn't own them in any way. That's an agent arrangement. So always look to a power of attorney document for those arrangements. Don't put another person on your assets for those kinds of reasons at all. Also, I've had clients who have set things up, again, trying to avoid probate, and say, for example, multiple CDs, and will use the payable on death, transfer on death arrangement, and take one CD and put a child on each one, thinking everything is evenly divided and there'll be no probate. What can happen over time, though, is that arrangement is f forgotten about or not even known about perhaps by the children or circumstances change and one of those accounts, one of those CDs has to be cashed out to pay for long-term care. All of a sudden we have a terrible imbalance that was never planned to occur at all. We just want to be sure we can avoid those kinds of things. The most comprehensive way to go about this is uh, something most of you have heard about today, I'm sure, which is a revocable living trust. A revocable living trust is a will substitute. It's a document that is used to avoid probate, but also to provide a comprehensive plan that is easier to use during a period of incapacity, but also easier to keep up to date as things change, the assets decline, the trust can be amended and all of the assets it owns have just been amended also. It's a much easier a way to avoid probate, take care of these things, and we can eliminate those risky shortcuts and those pitfalls, very helpful things to do. Other risks that we want to avoid is will all revolve around ignoring the realities of life today, the many what-if possibilities and realities that can occur in the lives of any of us and primarily here in the lives of our beneficiaries. 
And those are the realities of, we all know the divorce rate is ridiculously high. Um, any of us can be disabled. Our beneficiaries can have addictions and a sudden influx of money with unfettered discretion can be a terrible thing to do in that situation. And in many families with multiple children, I have found that there seems almost always to be at least one child who seems to have what can be called spending issues of some kind. The pitfall here is leaving our inherited assets directly to those beneficiaries, just saying, upon my death, these three people divide everything, and there it is, outright. Without considering the available special protections, as I mentioned earlier, we can protect the assets as we give assets to our beneficiaries far more effectively and legitimately than we can protect our own assets. We can't simply say to rightful creditors, I'm sorry, you can't have those assets. I put a revocable trust around them and you can't have them. That doesn't work. If I'm controlling them, the creditors can get to them. It's different when I pass along an asset through an inheritance. So we can protect the inheritance for our intended beneficiaries from those experiences of a divorce where half of it may pass on the divorce table. If we set our share up for that child, we can protect it from being shared at all upon a divorce. We can put in thoughtful guidelines for a beneficiary who has addictions so that those will not make the situation worse. And we can put in some guidelines and spending protections for our beneficiaries with spending issues. Very importantly, if we don't use bonus protections, we can actually make a beneficiary who needs eligibility for government, for needs-based government benefits, a beneficiary with a serious disability or problem, we can still take care of them by using a special trust arrangement. So we need to be sure that we are distributing our wealth wisely, using the guidelines that are available, using the choice of a trustee who can work with the beneficiary, including the special protections and the plans for necessary assistance. So we'll take a closer look at some of those. In the next slide, we'll take a look at, at some of those kinds of things and what we can do. We don't want to miss out on these wonderful abilities to consider the estate planning bonus protections as our beneficiaries inherit the wealth we can pass along to them. We want to protect them from themselves and from others. So protecting inherited assets for a young beneficiary. We all have a sense of that. If we are leaving money and it could go to a young child, we all instinctively know we need to design a carefully thought about trust. We need to have a trustee appointed and a backup to that trustee. If that person, the first choice person cannot serve, we always want a backup. It's the what if contingency planning. And we want to have ages at which we want the beneficiary to be able to have access to some of the money, but with most of it still being managed. So we want to prevent, uh, present a plan. And in most of those cases, I suggest considering also an age at which that young beneficiary may have the right to become a co-trustee of that share, and eventually the trustee. So those are all the kinds of things that we can build into a trust share. If we have the spendthrift beneficiary who cannot handle money, the same situations. We want to build in the protections. As we mentioned, we want to protect about loss of the share to a divorce. We can say in our, in our language for that trust share that it is protected for the beneficiary, that it cannot be claimed in a divorce. We can also say it cannot be claimed in a lawsuit. We may have beneficiaries who are in high-risk professions and lawsuits are perhaps somewhat um, not unexpected, as we should say. We can protect this money 
for those people and they would greatly appreciate having that extra asset protection in their financial picture. And if there are creditors, we can design the inheritance that we have in the trust or document for them such that it cannot be attached by the creditors. There are wonderful things we can do with these bonus asset protection features of estate planning today. We also always want to plan for future generations. We think of estate planning as leaving our legacy, and that includes legacy planning for future generations. We're leaving our wealth perhaps to a child, and if it's our own child, then I find most people love their grandchildren, or even if they don't have grandchildren yet, they assume they'll love those grandchildren. So they very much are, are interested in also having a trust share developed upon the death of the child so that money will continue in trust for the grandchildren. Very, very wonderful thing to do. We want to be sure that if we do have in our lives a disabled beneficiary, someone who is likely to need long-term care, long-term needs-based government benefits, the old advice used to be uh, you need to disinherit that person. You can't leave money to them. It will simply throw them off their benefit program and it will be wasted. That's not the necessary or correct thing we like to consider today. There are special trusts that we can develop for those beneficiaries that can be protected for them so that they can have the benefit of the asset. They simply cannot own it and control it and it needs to be set up as what we call a special needs trust. Those are very important tools for planning in the case of families who can anticipate that this will be needed. We want a protective framework for almost all of our beneficiaries. I have clients who say, well, my child will never need that. He's, he or she is smarter than I am and whatever. And I say, fine, if your child were sitting right here and we asked your child, do you want me just to leave everything to you upon death and you can just add it to your own assets? But then, of course, if you get divorced or if you're sued, well, I guess that will go too. Or would you like for it to be in a trust? where it will have some guidelines, but it will be protected for you. It won't be shared in the case of a divorce. It will not be claimed in the case of a lawsuit, or your creditors cannot claim it. The child would probably speak up and say, that sounds terrific, tell me more. So those are all things to, um, to think about. And along the special needs trust, disabled beneficiary who may need government needs-based benefits, I think it is a very wise thing to include in estate planning today a contingent special needs trust, which is to say that the client may not have someone who fits that profile as they're doing their planning. But it could be at the time of death, there actually is a grandchild on the autism spectrum or someone who has had a terrible accident and is now in that situation and the client won't necessarily have thought to go back and revise the estate plan. But the document can say, if upon my death I have a beneficiary and I'm leaving a trust share for them and they are eligible for government benefits, then that trust share converts into a special needs trust automatically. And then the language needs to be there. But I recommend looking into that option. It can be um, a lifesaver to families. Also, as we're looking at pitfalls, we're moving into another category, which is looking at making sure that we don't forget to take advantage of other ways to leverage assets and use the tax laws today to do more with less. Um, as life moves on, we often find that the beneficiaries that we have a need to take care of are more independent. And there comes a point where we feel we can give a little more thought to our own legacy and what else has mattered to us and what we might want to do more of or start doing some of. Warren Buffett once said, it's one of my favorite quotes, and it's something close to this. Um, he had quite a bit of money and still does, as you know. He said that he wanted to leave enough money so each of his children would feel that child could do anything, but did not want to leave so much that any child could
could do nothing. And that's kind of a good uh, tone setting to realize that that sometimes our children don't need everything and we do get to have the, um, the satisfaction of leaving our legacy with meaningful choices for other causes and things that we have been involved in. We also want to make sure that we're aware of the special tax advantages of leaving a charity for, um, for certain types of assets that have income tax implications to a person who would inherit them. For example, retirement plan assets, as we know. When we pull the money out, we're going to have to pay income tax, or when our children inherit a retirement plan account and they pull the money out, they're going to have to pay income tax. But if that retirement plan or some part of it goes to a qualified charity, those charities are, as we know, tax exempt meaning that we can do more with less by naming a charity for retirement plan accounts and for appreciated assets. Deserves careful consideration because it can work some magic. It's often said that retirement plan accounts are the best place to, to uh, accumulate wealth, but the worst place to have it at death. But by working with a charitable organization, you can leverage that and make the best of both worlds. Also, in looking at charitable planning tax strategies, we want to be sure that we have looked at plan giving opportunities. We can do multiple things with these arrangements. We can meet our own philanthropic goals. We can get an income tax deduction during our lifetime and we can set things up to generate extra income, an income stream perhaps for ourselves or income for our loved ones with the remainder going to charity, hence the charitable giving and the tax deduction. There are wonderful things that can be done. It's a, a seminar in and of itself, well worth watching for sometime. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to draw your attention to an excellent website that I have no, um, no direct involvement with, but I have discovered it and looked back at it in preparing for this. And it actually is our own Georgetown's website. And the website link is there for you. But it simplifies charitable giving in a very, very, this, particularly this charitable giving of split interest gifts, where it's part for charity, part for individuals for income but it explores all the possibilities in a very accessible, understandable way. Asking, and I love this part, the key questions of when do you want to give it, what do you want to give it, why do you want to give it, and how do you want to give it? And it will lay out your options, and the Georgetown people are always available to answer the questions too. So I highly recommend that. Now we're going to move on to talk about the category of family feuds. As I mentioned, we always want to do our planning to minimize conflict and keep everyone happy. So we really don't like the idea that we are creating family feuds. But sometimes we do this. I'll be brief on this one, but I've been accused of having a personal crusade about this, so I do want to touch on it. And that is that the most frequent trigger in my own experience, and books have been written about this, and I hear the same thing from my clients when I bring up this topic. And that is the most frequent trigger for family feuds when someone has died is not about who got a million more than the other person, if that's the scenario. It is about who got this item of a personal possession, who got this item of tangible personal property that Aunt Mabel always wanted or I thought I was promised that and you got that. And this sh can be avoided. What, and I'll just be brief, what we should never do is have in the document, meaning in the will or in the trust, a simple statement that the person in charge, personal representative of a will, trustee of a trust, is to distribute the personal effects equally and equitably among my children, grandchildren, the multiple beneficiaries, whatever it is, because that is impossible to do. If there's one, more than one item of tangible personal property, 
then it's impossible to be equal and equitable. And we are giving the person we've honored with the job of being in charge a terrible headache and a no-win job. A couple of things we should do. First of all, we should consider giving away some items no longer needed during our own lifetime so that that person can enjoy them when we no longer use them. A client of mine called this, oh, you're saying give it with a warm hand, not a cold hand. And I thought that was more clever than anything I'd ever come up with. Also, there should be a specific memo about truly special items, a memo that the client writes saying, this item goes to this person, this item goes to that person, because those things sometimes have been promised, and that's the person who should get it, and be sure that memo is kept up to date. The next step is taking a look at all the things that aren't itemized in the memo and grouping them into meaningful categories. It can reflect financial value. There can be groupings of things that are purely sentimental, and it can be a combination of things depending upon what there is down the road. Then we simply select a process for who gets to participate in choosing things, and we say how it will be decided within each category, who goes first, random assignment of order usually works the best, start with one category of property, somebody starts taking turns going in the random order that's determined, and then when no one wants to choose anything, move on to the next category, whoever went last goes first this time, something of that kind. Essentially, we play parent one more time, we design a plan, and we also design a plan for what will happen to the things that were not selected by those beneficiaries. It has eliminated many a family feud. Sometimes with just a little hint, families come up with something like this themselves, but if they don't, it's very important to have it there. Moving on to another very serious family feud that it's within our power to avoid and that is creating a situation of uncertainty regarding medical decision-making and healthcare decision-making when we are no longer able to make our own decisions. We want to make the decisions that we can, and we want to clarify who has the authority to make decisions for us. The person who has authority to make decisions for us will be named in a health care power of attorney. That's the health care agent, medical power of attorney, whatever the local jurisdiction wants to call it. When we're no longer able to make our own decisions, that's who steps in and orders the doctors around and makes all decisions until we can make them again. Or maybe if we can't, that's the person who remains in charge. We also should consider a living will. That's the document where we can do our end of life decision making. It gives us the authority to decide in advance what are the situations in which we want to direct the treatment no longer be used. Then we need to discuss those wishes and provide those documents to each of the agents we have named, hopefully in advance. That way they know what the documents say, they can ask us questions, and they have them when they are needed. Also, then we can anticipate and address potential conflict situations. The most important potential conflict situation is clarifying the ultimate authority. If conflict occurs, uh, you will already have clarified it if conflict occurs between the children in this case, because a child is named as a health care agent, or they can be named jointly but I urge you to have a situation for breaking a tie if they just can't decide. They have different views because that's like having no decision makers. So give that, clarify that. But I mean more, this is a reflection of how medical decision making, how healthcare has changed today. Changes in medical care in hospitals today, really that has led to the fact that the doctor in the ICU at the end of life or in serious situations is less likely to be the person's own doctor, more likely to be a hospital employee, an intensivist. The past concern with living wills used to be that doctors were trained to treat. And the real history of living will is, was basically empowering individuals to have the authority to say, 
if this is my medical situation, persistent vegetative state, no hope of recovery and death is imminent, I do not want any further treatment employed and to have that be legally enforceable. Doctors were trained to treat. They had technology. That was actually an uphill battle, but that is no longer really an issue in most cases. Today, if there's a concern, it is that the doctors can be more quick to look at the language of a living will and stop treatment than the family members perhaps feel comfortable about. And I should mention that, um, that I think doctors remain the best people on the planet. I've been married to one for decades. So this isn't that I'm a, a person who doesn't like doctors. It's just the reality that, um, that our own doctors will likely not be taking care of us at the end of life. So we need to clarify if there is a difference of opinion. The healthcare agent child is saying, no, no, the, the fall just happened yesterday and we're not ready to pull the plug yet. This can't be what the document means. And the doctor is saying, no, this is what the language really means in my understanding. Then you need to decide if there's a difference of opinion, who wins? And that's as simple as essentially saying, if there is a conflict, blah, blah, then I want my living will to be honored with the interpretation of the physician, or it is to say that I want the agent whom I have named to have the ability to override the reading of my living will or even the language of my living will if my agent feels that's appropriate. So that's um, a heavy thing to think through, but far better for us to think it through than to envision the family feud that can ensue fighting the medical establishment. So give that one some thought. Um, and this is the final topic, which is the pitfalls that we can all fall into. <clears throat> and that is that after we've done all these things and tried to avoid all the pitfalls, then we can sabotage our own good plan through procrastinating, updating, reviewing it, keeping it the way it should be. So we need to update, update the people we've named, what we've said, and remember their circumstances and see if what we said is still appropriate. Remember always to coordinate the titling of our assets with the plan. Good idea every year when you're working on your income taxes. Also pull out your assets and make sure that they're still really titled and set up the way you think they are and that everything's coordinated because remember title controls. Failing to think long term, we want to remember that as generations increase, we may decide that actually we want our little grandchildren to have their own share down the road. So be sure to review it and think about it. Failing to consider in creating your own legacy. It may be time at some point to do more of that beyond immediate family. Don't let that slip by just through procrastination. Remember that that is a legitimate goal. There's more to life than just our family relationships. There are other things that have had meaning to us and want a legacy. And this is one near and dear, failing to nudge our adult children to get documents too. Um, we tend to think of the living will as for the senior citizens, but the Karen Ann Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan cases were the ones that made that household words and before the Supreme Court, those were very young people. They were auto accidents and a drug accident. So we need to be sure that we nudge our adult children, make sure they have what they need that is age appropriate and that they take care of their own planning too. There's nothing like saying, we've just revised our own estate plan, and by the way, we think maybe you need to get yours done too to um, move that along. So with that, I uh, thank you for your patience as I started talking really fast at the end, but I wanted to make sure we made it through everything. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Susan. This has all been very helpful and informative as people consider their long-term planning. The program is scheduled to go until about 1.15, so we have time for a few questions. Um, the first one is, is there an ideal age or point in your life when you should execute estate planning documents? And then how frequently should you be reviewing those plans? Sure, uh, the ideal age, and actually I kind of closed with that. Um, that anyone who is old enough to do a healthcare power of attorney, for example, and that's the age of 18 in all states I know of, needs to have that. I mean, any, any person can be in an accident. We need to have the right person able to take care of everything. 
um, also to take care of their financial affairs, a financial power of attorney. Everyone should have that. Children at various ages can have assets and those should be taken care of. There are famous people and I won't, I know we're short on time, my fault. Um, and uh, the movie stars, the people who are wealthy and famous, we read how they didn't have any estate planning and we don't want our own families to experience that. Reviewing the plans, that's a critical thing. Um, some general thoughts on that. Anytime the financial situation of the person changes, anytime the personal life changes in a meaningful way, birth of children, change of marital status, um, review it, review the people we've named, fiduciaries, the people we've named as agents and in charge. Um, younger people grow up and now they'd be perfect and we didn't think about them when we started and people we did name, maybe they're not well or they've moved away or aren't close to us anymore. So review those things all the time. Reviewing those appointments are critical. And in any event, the general rule of thumb among estate planning attorneys is in any event, every three to five years, and of course, any time the tax laws change in a significant way that would affect planning. That is a good segue into the next question, which is with possible changes to a state tax law coming, what changes are you recommending to your clients? My, uh, the crystal balls are, are pretty cloudy these days on that, but we all know that um, we've been through uh, an incredibly rapid time with the doubling of the exemption under the last administration to, uh, to you know, 11 million plus, and uh, President Biden campaigned on reducing that current 11.7 million to 3.5 million. Um, we're not, sh and wine backs in exemptions are not frequent, but the increase in the exemption was so rapid and dramatic that. Many people think that we may in fact settle in where we would be if the increased statute reverted back to what it was going to do or is going to do in 2025, which would be 5 million. So that's just a guess. What that means in terms of planning, more than ever, we need to plan with flexibility in our documents. We can't tie our whole plan rigidly on the exemption at that moment in time. We have to Again, do the what ifs, do contingency planning, say if the exemption is greater than this asset, whatever, that we have planned with flexibility. In, uh, in some cases, we even should consider having a fiduciary extra appointment, a trust protector who has the authority and ability to make some changes if, they, if it's in the best interest of all the beneficiaries um, and the laws have changed. Okay. Uh, the last question um, is, what should I consider in choosing an estate planning attorney? Any suggestions on resources to consult or where to start? Uh, choosing someone to do estate planning is clearly a process. Um, certainly, I'd say start by asking some of the, the smartest people you know. Um, and that would be financial people in the sort of industry, you know, other attorneys, financial advisors, and all of that. But you get an answer, and that just starts the process and start a list. Um, and then take a look at those names, because anyone can uh, sort of choose their best friend. Um, and it's important to take a look at the person. Anyone who is going to be doing estate planning, in my view, take a look at their website, at their credentials. Um, estate planning, in my view, needs to be the focus of their practice or a primary part of the legal practice. There are many attorneys who just sort of add wills and estates at the end of a long litany of things that they do. It is a rapidly changing, highly complex topic area. It used to be anybody could write a simple will and probate wasn't that hard. It's a whole different landscape now. So one answer is just a starting point. Per financial professionals, will give a recommendation, usually readily, because they work with estate planning attorneys. I would always also check out that recommendation, because it could be that that person just received a wonderful referral from that particular attorney, and so they're front and center in the thinking, but it doesn't mean that that's someone who really is focused on estate planning. So it is, and in major cities, many um, have a, you know, a 
Washingtonian magazine or you know, the best of Chicago, whatever. And I would take a look at those articles because often they're chosen by fellow professionals. And just again, just to start the list and then take a look at the names, research, read, ask other people, because it should be sort of a lifelong relationship, hopefully. So it's an important relationship. And actually, I know, Mindy, you have said before that Georgetown, they do the best they can when they hear about good people across the country because your office often gets asked this question. So if you have a particularly good experience with an estate planning attorney, it would be wonderful and a service to your fellow alums to let Mindy and her office know about it so her list can be expanding, as a thought. I assume that's okay, Mindy? Thank you, Susan, it is. We very much appreciate you taking the time today to share your expertise with our alumni and friends. Um, and thank you all, uh, the attendees, for joining us today. I encourage you to visit our website for more information and always feel free to reach out to the Office of Plan Giving with any questions on estate planning. Um, please look for our follow-up email, which will include more information on upcoming programs, as well as a feedback survey and a link to today's recording. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us.